Website content creation is the single most critical task in any site redesign, and yet all too often we approach it in entirely the wrong way. So in this episode, I'm gonna give you 10 steps to ensure your content is compelling. But let me start by recommending that if your budget allows, website content creation should be done by a professional. There is a misconception that just because you can write reports, marketing material, or business documents, that somehow that makes you qualify to write for the web. And let me be clear, it does not. Not every good writer can write for the web. In a post I wrote previously on my own website, I shared seven ways a great copywriter crafts compelling web content. And many of those techniques I shared are only learned through experience. That said, I'm a pragmatist and I recognize that not all of us can pay a professional copywriter. And on top of which, there are times when the individual behind a site should let their personality shine through. And in such situations, it makes a lot more sense if that person is the person writing the copy. So if you're in a position where you find yourselves having to write copy for a website, how can you ensure that it's the best copy possible? Well, the first step is to understand where things typically go wrong when it comes to writing copy on your website. Those with less experience creating website content tend to make four mistakes. They start from the wrong premise, they assume their audience knows things that they don't, and they fail to test and refine their copy over time. But most of all, they're just overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. And I wanna look at those four areas in a little bit more detail, starting with why people are starting from the wrong premise. When people start thinking about the content on their website, they begin by asking themselves, what do I want to say, rather than asking themselves, what does my audience want to know? Although what we have to say does matter, it matters less than answering the questions that your audience has about your product or service. The fact that people already um, are on your site means that they've already expressed at least some level of interest in what you have to offer. So your job is now to address any objections or concerns that they may have about the website and your offering, and you do that through your site content. Second, people tend to assume that their audience is like them and knows the same things that they do. And this is another common mistake that as we tend to write content for websites, we write it as if we're writing it for ourselves. And that's dangerous because most of us, as we're writing the content for our websites, are experts in the subject that we're writing about. The more you know about a topic, the further your perception of the subject differs from the majority of the people. You end up making presumptions about your audience's level of knowledge that is often not a refl true reflection of what's going on. For example, we often make the mistake of using terminology and structuring information in a way that makes little sense to our audience. Then there's our tendency to create the content for our websites and then just walk away. That's particularly dangerous as no website content is gonna be perfect on the first attempt. There's always room to optimize it and improve it. Without testing, you will almost certainly poorly structure your website's content or leave users with entirely the wrong impression about what it is that you offer. However, probably the biggest problem is that people feel utterly overwhelmed by the challenge of writing website content. And to be honest, if you don't feel like that, then you're massively underestimating the size of the task ahead of you because website content creation is a large and intimidating job. Those that feel overwhelmed become tempted to simply migrate their old content from their old website across to the new one. But as I have written in the past, this is absolute madness. One thing that can help with this feeling of being utterly overwhelmed is to have a robust process for creating your content. And I've therefore created a 10 step process that I use when writing content for websites. And hopefully it's gonna help you too. So let's dive into that with step one, create your value proposition. 
Earlier, I suggested that we often start from the wrong premise with website content. I encouraged you to ask what questions users have when they come to your website. Well, the first three questions that most people ask when arriving on a new website are, what does this website offer? How does it help me? And how does it deliver on those benefits? Of course, they're not necessarily consciously asking themselves those questions, but they are there and we need to address them with our website content. That's where your value proposition comes in. And I've recently written about this on my blog. And so I'm not going to repeat myself here. However, I will say that your website content needs a strap line that summarizes your offering, a list of benefits your offering provides your audience, and an explanation of how your offering actually delivers those benefits to the user. Now, creating this value proposition is always a good starting point for your website content creation process. You don't necessarily need the final version or even a full draft. However, you should at least have created a an outline of what you are considering as your value proposition before moving on to our second step, which is to pinpoint your user's objections. With your value proposition outline in hand, you can now start considering what objections or concerns users might have to that value proposition. Write a list of every objection a person might have to what it is that you offer and what might prevent them from taking action on your website. To create this list, I recommend talking to customer facing staff. However, I'd also encourage you to run a single question survey on your existing website, saying something like, if you decide not to contact us today, it would be useful to know why. If your call to action isn't contact us, then you can just change it to whatever is relevant. You can then list a load of common reasons why they might not choose to contact you, but you can also allow them an open field where they can enter other stuff. That survey will allow you to identify not only the objections that users have, but also get a sense of which of those reasons are most pressing based on the number of votes that it gets. You can also use a similar approach for gathering questions that your audience might have, which is our third step. A user doesn't just come to your website with uh, those three questions that I mentioned earlier. Collectively, they could be arriving with dozens, if not hundreds of questions that they want answered. If we know what these questions are, our website content will then be much more relevant to the user's needs. And we will also find that an excellent starting point for writing our content, making the whole process feel less intimidating. To find out what those questions are, we can simply ask users on the existing website. All we need is a simple survey question such as, what question did you most want to get answered on this website today? Also, you can talk to those customer facing staff again, salespeople, customer support teams. They'll certainly have no shortage of questions that they get asked regularly. You could also get further inspiration by looking at search terms, dwell time on existing content and what questions people are asking online more generally. So once you've got all your questions together, then we can move on to step four, which is identifying people's top tasks. As with objections, not all of those questions people ask will be of equal importance. We must discover which questions are most critical to address. Otherwise, users will struggle to find the answers amongst the plethora of information on our websites. Now to do that, we can carry out something called top task analysis. Top task analysis is an approach developed by a guy called Jerry McGovern designed to identify the tasks that users most care about completing on your website. Jerry defines a task very broadly, including questions that people might want answering or objections that they have that they wish addressed before proceeding. Now, I won't go into massive details about the process. However, the process involves collecting tasks and then surveying users to discover which of those tasks is most important to people. Users are presented with a long list of tasks and asked to prioritize their top five um, that are most important to them. By doing this exercise, we can identify which questions or tasks matter the most to people, and that allows us to focus our website's content around those. 
An alternative to top task analysis would be to run a survey asking people to propose questions, just like we did earlier with objections. However, instead of only gathering the answers, the survey would also allow people to vote other people's suggestions up and down at the same time. That will give you an indication of the top questions without the need to do necessarily a full top task analysis. The approach you adopt will be dependent on your time and budget. However, knowing what website content is most important to users is crucial for organizing your content, which is step five. Website content creation is not just about writing content. It's also about organizing your website content in a way that enables users to find what they're looking for. So by this stage of the content creation process, you will have a substantial number of content areas that we need to address. Things like the benefits, the features, the objections, the questions. It would be all too easy to create a structure that makes it impossibly hard for somebody to find the answer to any one of those specific questions. So to overcome that problem, we need to organize the website content in a way that matches how our audience thinks. I've written before about how to decide on your site's information architecture and structure it around users' mental models. However, the critical component of that process is an exercise called card sorting. In essence, we take a list of the benefits, features, objections, and questions, and then we extract a total of approximately 30 items from that list based on their importance to users. In a card sorting exercise, we then put each list item on a separate card and give the cards to the user. We then ask the users to group those cards in any way that makes sense to them. Finally, we ask each participant to label each group of cards um, with a title that seems appropriate for that group. Carrying out this exercise allows us to start building an information architecture to organize our website content. We can take the exercise further once we've got our top level sections by asking users to organize the remaining list items that we didn't use in the initial card sorting exercise into those top level categories that we created. Fortunately, there are some great tools out there like UX Ops that allows us to carry out the entire card sorting exercise online and that helps us to understand the results that we get back. By the end of the card sorting exercise, you will now have your site structure. And that is where things get interesting. And we come on to step six, build and test your website's content. At this point, I usually start creating a clickable prototype of my website. In some cases, I do this with a fresh content management installation, but where that's not possible, I use a tool like Notion to allow me to start organizing my content into something I can click between pages using. On each page, I start adding bullet points, outlining whatever benefits, features, objections, or questions the page will eventually answer. If time allows, this gives me something tangible I can test with users. I can ask users to find the answers to a particular question or objection and watch what happens. Can they work out where the relevant information is and successfully navigate there? If they do so, did they do it by the most direct route and how much did they need to think about what they're doing? However, there is another great advantage to this approach too. And that brings me on to point seven, which is to create that initial draft of content for our website. You see, a clickable prototype provides the content creator with a starting point for drafting site's content. They can see other pages that the user is likely to have come from. They will also be able to see pages that the user is likely to end up at. However, most critically, they have a list of questions, objections, features, and benefits that that particular page of the website needs to address. Given time and budget, I start by bullet pointing each of the answers to these various uh, components rather than diving straight into writing the full content. That allows me to go back to users again and see how they respond to the answers that I've bullet pointed up before I spend too long creating the full and final copy. However, whether you bullet point first or not, the next step is to start drafting the content for each page. What I would recommend is avoiding trying to make the website content of each page perfect before moving on to the next. 
The problem with this approach is that you'll find that you need to move content around or restructure the content based on user feedback. And that's um, going to be harder to do the more heavily edited and refined the copy is. Instead, I add layers of fidelity to the copy with each pass across the entire site. For example, I start by just listing the content that needs to be addressed. I then bullet point um, each of the various points before moving on to write an initial draft. Only after I've written the initial draft of the entire website's content do I then look at editing and refining it further. Which brings me on to step eight, edit and refine your website content. The editing phase of my website content creation process consists of basically three steps. I pass my website content through Grammarly to correct any spelling or grammar mistakes uh, when I wrote my initial content. I then read the content back out loud to make sure that the tone feels conversational and engaging. And finally, I look through the copy, seeking out opportunities to aid scannability by adding headings, imagery, pull out quotes, that kind of thing. It helps when editing website content also to have a content style guide to hand to ensure that the content that you're writing has got the right tone of voice when you're reading the copy back. At the very least, you should have a clear picture of what kind of tone of voice you're going for. For example, you're trying to be professional or approachable. It's then worth testing to see if you've achieved this. And that brings me on to step nine, test your final website content. Last time we tested, the emphasis was on testing your information architecture. However, this time around, we're going to be checking the page's visual hierarchy. In other words, we need to ascertain whether a user can find the specific answer to their particular question in a page of text and whether it's or not it's been lost in the noise of the page. We can do this using a simple usability test where we pay particular attention to how long it takes people to find the answer to the particular test question. You could even use a tool like Maze to gather qual uh, quantitative data on how long it takes somebody to complete a task. The other thing that we want to test is whether the tone of voice of our copy matches the personality that you want to communicate. For example, let's imagine that you want to come across as friendly. You can simply ask participants on a scale of one to five, how strongly do you agree with the statement, this company seems friendly, after they've read the copy, obviously. Once you've carried out this final round of testing and addressed any issues that come up, you can now launch the website. However, that doesn't mean your website content creation process is over. We still have one more step, and that is to monitor and refine the content of our website. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to launch your website content and then abandon it. There is nothing worse that you can do, and there is so much opportunity to improve your website content once the site has gone live and you begin gathering real data about how people are interacting with it. For example, Google Analytics may show you that a lot of people are abandoning the website on a particular page, and perhaps that's because some aspect of the content is putting them off. Alternatively, some heat map software like Hotjar could show the users um, are scrolling past a critical piece of content, and so your web page needs to be rewritten to place the essential content higher on the page. Then, of course, there's the opportunities to start doing A-B testing, different content um, to see what performs the best. You could improve everything from headlines to calls to action by experimenting with various alternatives. We can learn so much about our website content and how it resonates with users once our site is live, and it would be madness to walk away from that. Look, the big takeaway from this particular episode should be that creating website content is not like writing for any other medium. Almost all other mediums are linear, while website content can be viewed in any order, and so how our users will respond to it is unpredictable. To make matters worse, according to research by the Nielsen Norman Group, users typically only read about 28% of the content of a website, which is why scannability and writing style matter so much. And that's why I recommend that you um, do at least some testing and refinement during the process. You can't merely sit down and write pages and pages of copy from beginning to end if you want people to actually take it in and respond to it.
Ultimately, I advise most people to get a professional copywriter to at least help them create their content writing process. It always strikes me as insane that people will spend a lot of money on a content management system and the design that holds the copy, but they won't spend money on the creation of the content itself. And that needs to change.